my mind. Hello, everybody. I, can everybody hear me? I think we're about to start. Uh, my name is uh, Ike Nahum. I'm a longtime uh, activist in the uh, Cuba Solidarity anti-war movements for many, many years, um, uh, representing New York, New Jersey, Cuba Sea Coalition. Uh, as a retired uh, Amtrak locomotive engineer, I got to take my rail pass up from New York City and save the Conley Forum a little money there, so that's good. Anyway, uh, John tells me that the tradition here at the Conley Forum is that we do um, uh, announcements at the beginning. So I'm going to ask anybody if they have an announcement that they would like to give for an upcoming event or anything, really, and then we'll do those, and then we'll move on with our really excellent program tonight. Someone should announce this, because we only have one flyer. So who's from the Palestinian Rights Committee? I have it. I have it. And there's a lot of other flyers in the front, too, for folks. Go ahead. Oh yeah, Tom Ellis, the local Palestinian Rights Committee is going to have a film festival and our first film is going to be September 17th at 5.30 at the Howe branch of the Albany Library in uh, the South End of Albany. It's called Disturbing the Peace and it's a film about um, Israeli and Palestinians whose family members have been killed by the other side and they come together and the idea that they need to stop killing each other and they need to find some way to resolve the conflict in a way that is just for the Palestinians. So this is called Disturbing the Peace. 5.30 on September 17th. I'll put the flyer over here. I only have two flyers, sir. Thank you. <coughs> Anybody else? John. Yeah, the, the forum series doesn't have a particular speaker lined up yet. We're having discussions with David Harvey and uh, a, a, a someone from Haiti about a forum on Haiti, and there are other th discussions in the work, farm workers, and we'd like to do a forum on Puerto Rico, but if you want to find out what the next forum is going to be, please make sure you're on our email list, okay? Thanks. Yes, sir. I, uh, the preamble to this is that I came here as a nominally Jewish refugee in 1941, uh, when I was 11. Uh, and I got familiar with the phrase, um, never again. And I noticed that about half the Jews in America were saying, never again should anything like that happen to Jews. Yeah. And uh, that the other half uh, meant Never again, anybody. And uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, on Sunday, this Sunday at 2 o'clock, somewhere in <coughs> Troy, and I didn't bring anything with me, so I, it's a park that I had never heard of before. Uh, oh, Tara Shevchenko? Yes, that one. Yeah. If, if you can give a little bit more direction about that, that would be helpful. But it's sponsored by, certainly by Jewish Voice for Peace, but also by other uh, uh, Jewish individuals and groups. Uh, however, everyone is welcome uh, on that important phrase, never again. So that's, do you have, what is the date on that? Sunday. Sunday. This <coughs> coming Sunday. That there's been a number of protests around the country that have been spearheaded by Jewish organizations around immigrant rights, so that would be good. And, yes. Uh, that park is at Third uh, Street and Fourth Street. Apparently, they come together there. Great. Everybody got that? Okay. All righty. So, uh, if there's any no more announcements, we'll proceed. Uh, I would like to just start by thanking the Connolly uh, Forum, uh, named for a genuine hero of the international working class that I'm sure. Everybody here knows, and, and uh, you all in Albany, Troy area, were, were, uh, had the honor of have, having him lived here, uh, I guess, in 1903. Um, and uh, I know myself back home, me and my wife, we have three cats, and the oldest one is named Connolly. So uh, we have <laughs> all our cats after revolution. We have Celia after Celia Sanchez, and, uh, and our youngest one is 
named Yap, after the famous Vietnamese general. Anyway, so and I'd also always like to thank uh, my friend and uh, brother uh, John Flanders for the invitation to chair this, uh, this important forum. And it is very important for a number of reasons, not only to just get the latest information and updates on uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, long now uh, economic and political and with military threats uh, against Venezuela, um, but also it's a platform, I think, for, for those of us that are gearing up for the <clears throat> coming period of struggle uh, and militant resistance as we enter, especially as we enter the U.S. election season, uh, against the measures that have been pushed by the uh, Donald Trump White House uh, against uh, Venezuela and Cuba. So this is really a, a, a platform for people that want to uh, that, that want to fight these things. And uh, 2019 has really been an extraordinary uh, period in the development and unfolding of the the historic uh, continuity and some discontinuity of U.S. intervention in Latin America, Central America, and the Caribbean, and we're going to we're going to try to get into that tonight. Uh, already, we are seeing the unintended, unintended consequences of the U.S. Uh, debacle in in Venezuela. Um, the, uh, the, the ongoing, the growing political turmoil as a consequence of that in Colombia, Brazil, Argentina, not only for that, but in, in all of this, while we're in the cusp of, of the next, uh, you know, major economic uh, 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 downturn um, uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the world uh, capitalist economy. So, since the, eight, since the April 30th debacle, um, Trump and his team of, uh, you know, vipers, I guess was sort of the nicest word I could come up with, uh, for like uh, John Bolton, Pompeo, and the uh, dusted up uh, war criminal Elliot Abrams, um, pivoted to blaming, when they, when they had the fiasco and the failure of their attempted military coup, or their sort of virtual coup almost, uh, you know, that they pivoted towards blaming Cuba, revolutionary <laughs> Cuba, for their failure, for their own debacle of their own making. Uh, they said that Cuba had 20,000 soldiers in Venezuela. Hopefully you'll be able to <laughs> tell us in your wide travels all the Cuban troops you saw on the streets in Caracas, uh, when really Cuba has about, I think, about 18,000 medical personnel and doctors and nurses in Cuba and about 2,000 teachers and other uh, dangerous uh, uh, people like that. He's always in Cuba. But they have done that. They have used that to pivot to try to, uh, to step up their measures against Cuba and against Venezuela, the two tied together. They threatened to seize Venezuelan shipments of oil going to Cuba on the open seas. They've actually threatened to do that openly and publicly. Cruise ships, which was an important and growing part of Cuban exchange, foreign exchange, that they earned, uh, where 600,000 people, including from the United States, could legally go to Cuba and and uh, stop off, and you know, it's not their preferred method of keeping people off of cruise ships, but they were able to gain significant foreign exchange from that that helps pay for their free medical care and all the other uh, conquests of the, of the Cuban Revolution. Um, there was the elimination of the Title III uh, waiver that had been waived ever since the passage of the Helms-Burton Law, where uh, where uh, uh, now the way is open for all these frivolous lawsuits of people. I read one guy that some some counter-revolutionary exile that said that before the revolution, his family owned the entire port of Havana, and he wants it back. <laughs> and he's suing now. Now he can do that because of the waiver of Title III. So of course the Cubans are not going to pay any attention to that in any, you know. But but nevertheless, this is a part of the pressure. So, um, tonight we're going to have this discussion uh, and talk about these things focused on Venezuela um, because what we're trying to do tonight in addition to exchanging information and experiences 
is that we want to build in Albany, as we're trying to do all over the country, people that are committed and active to fighting against these policies and demanding uh, U.S. hands off Venezuela and U.S. Cuba, uh, hands off Cuba. So we're very happy tonight to have with us two longtime activists that have really been in the in the ah, you know the heat of the struggle in the in 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 the in the center of it, uh, and that's uh, Margaret Flowers and Kevin Zeese. Uh, they are both co-directors of Popular Resistance. Uh, and the co-founders of the Venezuelan Embassy and Venezuela Embassy uh, Protection Collective. Both were, as I'm sure you read about uh, while that was going on, uh, courageously with 30, uh, for 37 days uh, were in the Venezuelan Embassy that had been, you know, basically seized by the uh, fake <coughs> virtual government in Venezuela, and uh, after 37 days with two others, on May 16, 2019, uh, U.S. Uh, 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 paramilitary police forces essentially rammed down the door and arrested them, and they can tell you about the, the amazing uh, uh, charges that, they've, uh, <laughs> that they're being charged with them and the story of what the collective accomplished. And I would also like to just add uh, before I turn the floor over to them, that, that Margaret, I understand, was one of the original uh, speakers at the James Connolly Forum back in 2011. Is that correct? One of the, one of the early speakers. One of the earliest. So anyway, so please welcome Kevin and Margaret. And First of all, thank you all for coming out on Thursday night and spending it with us. We are looking forward to having a conversation with you. We're going to try to keep our comments to about a half an hour. That should leave us about an hour for dialogue. So that's our plan. We sometimes tend, we could fill the whole 90 minutes talking. So uh, we, we're going to try to control ourselves. Uh, what we plan to do is um, have this video of a series of about 100 or so pictures going. Uh, the pictures are uh, above the, of the Embassy Protection Collective's action. Uh, they're pretty much in chronological order, uh, although not completely, pretty close to chronological order. And uh, that'll, that'll just be a continuous reel uh, through, the, through this uh, session. Uh, we plan to start out, uh, before we get to the Embassy Protection Collection Collective activities, we're going to start out uh, talking about the coup, uh, how it began, what it's about, and what's still going on with the coup. That was like the beginning. Would you like the light off? It's up to you. So whatever you all think. Um, maybe yeah. we'll some of the lights off. Um, well, that's much better, isn't it? But for the video, does that work? Does that work for your video, though, John? That's fine. OK, great. So anyway, you'll see how this evolved. It's, a, it's quite a story. And then we'll, but we're going to begin by talking about the coup and how it began and what's going on. I'll start, let Margaret start with that. Good evening, everyone. It's great to be here. And thank you for coming out. So probably most of you are pretty well informed about the coup, but I just wanted to run through it a little bit in case people don't know the story. Of course, ever since Hugo Chavez was elected in 1998, the United States and the business class have been trying to overthrow the Bolivarian process and have done through, uh, tried to do so through various mechanisms. Most recently in last year, they tried to delegitimize the presidential election. Kevin was there for it. He can tell you about it. It was a very well run uh, election and President Maduro won by the vast majority uh, in that election. So he is the democratically elected president of Venezuela and he was inaugurated in January of this year. But the United States, because they didn't recognize the election as legitimate, claimed that he was not the legitimate president and that, in fact, that office was empty. And so they tried to twist the Constitution basically to say, well, since it was empty, then the president of the National Assembly is the president. And the National Assembly, you may know, is not actually a governing body right now because it's uh, been found by the Supreme Court of Venezuela to not be in compliance. There are about four members who were elected that their election practices were fraudulent. They were ordered to re, you know, redo those elections and they refused to do that. So the Supreme Court said, well, until you do that, you're not a legitimate body. Uh, so basically, Mike Pence calls Juan Guaido, 
says, hey, you're our guy, go ahead, tell, say you're the president, we'll be behind you. And on January 23rd, Guaido stood up and said, I am the president of Venezuela. And the U.S. immediately recognized him as Canada did and a number of other U.S. allies in uh, right-wing countries of Latin America and in Europe. And so uh, that created a predicament. And we were down in Venezuela in March. And uh, while we were down there, the United States started handing over properties, Venezuelan properties, to Juan Guaido and his people. And so they handed over the consulate in the UN consulate in New York and two military attache buildings in DC. And in April, April 9th, the Organization of American States changed their rules arbitrarily so that they could recognize Juan Guaido as the legitimate president of Venezuela, which was, this has caused all kinds of problems for the OAS because you know, the countries are like looking at it and going, oh, well, we have these rules and you just change them so you can declare who's the president of, of a country. So you could actually do that to us as well, right? So um, Louis Amalgro, who's the current head of the OAS, is probably destined to no longer be the head of, of that. But that said, um, Venezuela had broken off diplomatic relations with the United States. The U.S. diplomats in Venezuela were using the embassy as an organizing, this will surprise you, I'm sure, as an organizing base for the opposition. And so the last diplomats in the United States were the OAS diplomats. And so on April 10th, the State Department gave them two weeks to leave the country. They're supposed to have two months. They gave them two weeks. And so that April 10th, we went down to the embassy, so did uh, Code Pink, Medea Benjamin was there with us, and Answer Coalition, and the three of our organizations decided to form the Embassy Protection Collective. And we asked the Venezuelans you know, if we could be there and do that, and I'll let Kevin get into that story. But anyway, so um, you referenced like, the April 30th uh, was another attempt at the coup, and so Juan Guaido claimed that he had all this backing from the military and they were basically gonna march over to Miraflores and take it over and that was very easily put down. Um, Russia has been working closely with the Venezuelan government and brought in um, military advisors as well as intelligence advisors and it's been really interesting to see, this is not covered in the US media very much, um, but they've been able to discover other attempts that were uh, going to happen. Um, oh, I forgot to mention on April 30th, uh, Leopoldo Lopez, the head of the voluntary, the Popular Will Party, of which Juan Guaido is part of, and Carlos Vecchio, the new ambassador, quote unquote ambassador, was the uh, chief operating officer of the uh, Popular Will. Uh, Leopoldo Lopez was uh, sprung from his house arrest during that coup and sought refu refuge in the Spanish embassy, and he continues to be there today, uh, hiding inside of that embassy, while the Spanish government continues to do business with the Maduro government. So it's a very interesting situation. Um, but since then, they, you know, they've, the Venezuelan government has discovered all sorts of plots and coups, you know, coup attempts. Uh, there was a major operation. The U.S. was backing with Venezuela's money to uh, bring uh, Central American paramilitary mercenaries in. They were being trained in Colombia, and they were going to do this whole big uh, action and uh, shut down infrastructure, assassinate leaders, and that was foiled. Um, there was another attempt where they were going to try a military coup, and, and the weird thing was they had 100 IDF uh, Israeli Defense Forces in Colombia ready to assist with that one, where they were literally going to massacre people in the street. That was part of their plan with, to create chaos. Um, they, of course, have had infrastructure attacks already. When we were there, they had a power outage, uh, basically almost a nationwide power outage. That came from a cyber attack from the United States. And then as they tried to get that back up and running, there were uh, more attacks on the infrastructure, electromagnetic attacks, as well as several substations that were blown up. Um, so this is kind of the US's attempt to, now that they can't win an election, they couldn't stop the election, uh, so they're trying, you know, basically terrorism. And just this week, uh, the Venezuelan government identified Colombian terrorist training camps right along the border with Venezuela and notified the Colombian government that these were going on and asked them to please do something about it. And the Colombian government, of course, is refusing to do anything about it. On top of that, 
is the unilateral coercive measures that the United States is using. And we call them sanctions here in the United States, but technical process that found that there was a problem and is using sanctions as a punishment. These are unilateral coercive economic measures that are in violation of the United Nations Charter that the U.S. is using against Venezuela and has been really stepping them up. On August 5th, Donald Trump signed an executive order basically creating a blockade of Venezuela. And strangely, the language is so you know, broad that anybody that aids the Maduro government in any way could actually be subject to, I don't know, punishment, preventing them from coming into the country, what have you. And the impact of the economic measures has been severe for people living in Venezuela. Uh, the Center for Economic and Policy Research, CEPR, did a study back in, I think it was April or May. They found that that the economic measures contributed to the deaths of 40,000 Venezuelans from 2017 to the time of the study. So um, when we were down there, in the food is plentiful, it's expensive. Um, that's the problem. And um, they do have a program called the CLAP program where they distribute food boxes once or twice a month to over six million families for ba basically pennies. And that keeps people going. You don't see people that look like they're starving there. You also don't see any homeless people, which is amazing. Um, but they are, they do say that, you know, what you can eat is limited. And the biggest problem is medications. Uh, they, Venezuela used to be, uh, they've had, gosh, over 50, I think, pharmaceutical manufacturers down there and had a high level of pharmaceuticals per capita. But because of the economic measures, they can't get the precursors to run those, those plants. And so they have like an 85% deficit of medications. And this has had a huge impact. And of course, they tried to buy medications from other countries. And the US called those countries and said, if you do business with Venezuela, we'll punish you. So, you know, so it's not bad enough that we impose our measures. But then we go and threaten and bully other countries that Venezuela reaches out to. So the foreign minister of Venezuela, Jorge Arreaza, uh, met with Elliot Abrams after the coup attempt. And Abrams basically said, this is, we're in it for the long haul. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing, you know, illegal economic measures against them. We're seeing uh, money seized from Venezuela being used to fund these terrorist cells, and uh, and we can expect more attempts at trying to create chaos along the border or going into Venezuela and trying to create chaos. But the. The amazing thing about Venezuelans is that they have such a deep understanding of U.S. imperialism, really from everybody that you talk to. And so what you hear in the media here about, you know, there's chaos down there, there's a great division, that actually isn't the case. And uh, people understand what's going on. And, and the opposition's outspoken support for military intervention by the U.S. has driven even those who don't love President Maduro, he's not a perfect person, as nobody is, and he's certainly made mistakes, has driven them to support him because they see what the alternative is with that opposition. So he does enjoy uh, pretty widespread support right now. And um, another interesting piece is that Venezuela has a civilian militia that ever since Donald Trump took office and made threats of military intervention, they've been training and arming the civilian militia. They have over two million militia members, and it's amazing. I mean, they're like men and women at every age, you know, you see women in their 70s that are part of this militia. And so they intend to continue to grow that. And so it would really be a huge mistake if the United States decided to intervene militarily. One, because we couldn't win uh, a fight like that. But the other, because the people that will be most impacted, because it's it's the barrios and the you know lower income communities where you see widespread support, the, the deepest support, and uh, those are the communities that would probably be attacked first in, in the situation if the U.S. were to intervene. So, um, I think that's most of what's. You can probably add some to the current what's going on currently. Um, yeah, I'll just mention two things to add. Margaret mentioned I was in the uh, in Venezuela for the election last May. Uh, well, May, 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 a year before uh, last May, uh, and it was great to see how the Venezuelan election system works. Uh, in so many ways, it's better than the United States election system. Uh, I'll just mention a couple. One, right to vote is in their constitution. When you have a right to, we don't have that. A right to vote in your constitution, then the government has to help you exercise that right. 
And so rather than having long lines where people wait four or five hours to vote, Venezuela actually keeps track of the lines. If they need more voting machines, they need more precincts, they have them. And so it's actually relatively easy to vote. They have very high voting turnout. They also have 95% registered voters. Uh, and that's been increasing consistently uh, during the Bolivarian process. Uh, and one, one thing they do at the end of election day, uh, it's just the opposite of the United States, where we fight recounts, we fight audits. On the end of election day, they have a people's audit, where at every precinct, 54% of the machines are randomly selected. And they, uh, they have a, both an electronic ballot and a paper ballot. The voter looks at the paper ballot, puts it in a box. At the end of the day, they take all those ballots out of the box, and in front of the cameras, in front of all the parties, in front of the public, they count each ballot and show it to everybody. They count all the ballots for 54% of these machines, and they compare that to the electronic count. If it's accurate, the count's good. If not, they count every vote by hand in that precinct. So and here, of course, we fight audits and recounts. There they do it as part of the process. Very important. Uh, Jimmy Carter says it's the best electoral system in the world. Uh, he may be right about that. Uh, it's, it really is a well run. And you know, at, at, in his last town, one of his town halls, Bernie Sanders was uh, said something about Venezuela where he said that uh, they should have another election. This time they should have elect international election observers. Well, there were actually 100, more than 150 international election observers in that May election, uh, and they were unanimous in saying that the. Standards used in the Venezuelan election process met all the requirements of de democratic votes in, in, under international law. Unanimous that Maduro was elected and was legitimately elected, and he was in fact the president. The UN still recognizes Maduro. Venezuelan law still recognizes Maduro. The appointment of Guaido violated ve Venezuelan law in many ways. We can go into that if you want to later. Uh, but it was a, so all this talk about Maduro as a dictator is a falsehood. And what's interesting about that election is that the United States, as Margaret mentioned, used their embassy in Caracas to try to undermine it. They pushed a boycott of both candidates and voters, tried to suppress the vote. Uh, they still had almost 50% turnout, which is low for them, uh, but they still had 50, almost 50% turnout. Maduro got 67% of the vote. There were legitimate candidates running against them, a former governor. Uh, who had been a Chavista and turned uh, to the other side, put forward a very U.S. favored agenda, tying the Venezuelan uh, money to the U.S. dollar, uh, getting an IMF loan, you know, all the stuff that you'd expect from a, a U.S. allied leader. And he lost, he got 20, 24 or 5 percent of the vote compared to Maduro, 67. Uh, the other thing I just want to mention is that one thing that's important about the situation in Venezuela is that it's a geopolitical battle because both China and Russia, as well as uh, Turkey, uh, Iran, a number of other countries are allied with Venezuela. Uh, China just invested um, $5 billion more in the Venezuelan oil industry after Trump announced the most recent uh, sanctions, uh, the illegal uh, unilateral course of measures that were supposed to stop that. China ignored that. Uh, Russia announced an agreement with Venezuela to sh par park uh, port their uh, Navy vessels in Venezuela on, the, on their coastline. He did this about a, a, a four or five days before it came out that Trump was going to use U.S. Navy ships to blockade Venezuela. So I think uh, Putin kind of put a checkmate on that by saying, we're going to have our ships there too. And so I think Pentagon rethinks that and uh, so that's not going to happen. So if this escalates into a military conflict, it could become a global conflict. And so it's a really important issue, and uh, an important issue beyond that. Let me now talk about uh, the collective. So uh, we were there, as I mentioned, for 37 days. We began on April 10th. On April 9th was the day when uh, the Organization of American States, after manipulating their rules, really normally it requires a two-thirds vote to recognize a new government. Uh, they changed the rules to a majority and barely got a majority. And normally when the OAS votes to recognize a new government, there's like applause, everyone's so happy. But in this one, when that vote happened, it was like embarrassment. People just, even though those who voted for it, just like were, they realized maybe they're signing their own death warrant. They can do this to Venezuela. Who can't they do this to? Uh, and so, but the day after that, uh, we, went, we joined Medea Benjamin in the Venezuelan embassy. The government of Venezuela had given us permission to stay there. Uh, they, they, their diplomats were still there. They had two weeks to leave, and so for the first two weeks, 
Uh, we were there with the diplomats and staff. They got to know, we got to know each other, understand what was allowable, what was not allowable, and uh, we proceeded to uh, stay after they left. That first, those first two weeks, we had forums every night uh, on a whole range of issues. We had that AFRICOM forum put on by uh, Black Alliance for Peace, uh, and that talked about how we have to end AFRICOM. We had a forum on Honduras, we had forums on Venezuela. Uh, and on the night before the uh, OAS ambassadors from Venezuela to schedule leave, uh, and so we thought once the ambassadors left, we'd be likely attacked uh, or arrested uh, by the U.S. government. Uh, the night before that, we had John Kiriakou speak. John Kiriakou is a former CIA official, and he spoke about regime change from, viewed from inside the CIA. So the night before the U.S. is about to take this embassy over, we have a CIA guys talking about what regime change is like in the, inside the CIA. And it was an amazing talk. I mean, it, it should have been reported throughout the country because it really, there's a regime change office in the CIA that Congress doesn't even know about. Uh, and he described how it worked, and people would bring ideas of what country they're going to do a coup in. Uh, the idea would be talked out there, then it would be shared with the national security staff and with the Department of Justice. If they approved it, it came back to the CIA, they got a lot of the budget, and they went forward with the coup. Uh, it's just bizarre, but that's, and the Congress didn't even know it exists. And, so, and the media didn't discuss it. And I think that's one of the things about this, this uh, whole action was, this was like made for TV. I mean, it had incredible video images, all sorts of conflicts between coup supporters and peace advocates, people inside the embassy, people breaking into the embassy, coup supporters <laughs> broke into the embassy multiple times uh, and break windows and they go up to a room and they'd be stuck in a room on the third floor, we'd have to get them out, so it's all sorts of amazing stories, but there was a blackout. Mm -hmm. The only thing we had, which was great, we had fantastic uh, independent and social media, uh, and we had some embedded journalists uh, who had did a fantastic job reporting what was going on. We got a lot of coverage on, on uh, social media, so people knew about it. We were, we were amazed when we came out how many people were following this regularly. Uh, the ambassador uh, to the UN for Venezuela said he was following it every hour he would check to see how we were doing. Uh, when people told us that Maduro would get up and the first thing he'd ask his staff, how are my protectors doing? You know, it's like, whoa, you know. And, and, we, and all sorts of uh, peace advocates in the United States followed it as well. So even though it was a blackout, the community knew about it. Uh, and so we, we did get that. So we, we went in uh, on, on the 10th, held, held these forums, uh, and the holding of the forums was important because each forum reached a different group. Uh, that was concerned about these issues. And so we'd get Nicaraguans, Hondurans, you know, uh, peace activists, anti-imperialist groups, black alliance groups, all sorts of groups. And so by doing that, we got the word out to lots of networks. And so as a result of that, it grew and grew. And when the, uh, on April 30th, as Margaret mentioned, there was a coup attempt uh, in Caracas. And uh, um, at that coup attempt, uh, they, they failed very quickly. In, in Caracas, but at the same day of that coup attempt, the opposition came to the embassy. And we had a battle that day uh, to control the front entrance with the coup supporters. And the police, the Secret Service, which is in, Secret Service is in charge of embassies, uh, they're, they're, that's their responsibility in the Vienna Convention to protect embassies. They were not doing that uh, in this case. Uh, but they, they allied with the coup supporters, and they allowed the coup supporters to surround us three sides, the fourth side was a canal in Georgetown, and they allowed them to put tents right up to the, uh, on embassy property, uh, it was just, and they allowed them to assault uh, our allies and stop them from coming in. If a victim, one of our, our allies was assaulted, the person who was the victim would get arrested. Uh, and so we had multiple people arrested who were assaulted. Uh, they also blocked food from coming in. And so uh, we had, at the peak of this process, about 70 people staying in the embassy with us overnight. 70 people. The, the embassy was at full staff, held 80 personnel. It's a, a, a four floor plus a basement, plus two floors of garage. It's a big building in the middle of Georgetown. And uh, so we had 70 people staying. Uh, gradually they would leave because they had health issues, they had family issues, work issues, school issues, various reasons people came and went. We'd have that. And, uh, and, and as it started to uh, get more aggressive on the outside, these coup supporters surrounded us and essentially assaulted us 
uh, with you know, aggressive lighting, with aggressive sound, with uh, uh, racist comments to our black allies, with homophobic comment to, uh, comments to our gay allies, sexual assault threats to women, uh, you know, the cutting of the throat action. Uh, anytime we try to get food, there'd be a battle on the ground. The way we got food in some of the time, you may see some of the pictures, uh, we uh, would take a, a duffel bag, tie a rope to it, throw it out the second floor. Our allies would fill that with, with food. We'd pull it up by rope. And we were successful in getting food in a few ways, that, a few times that way. Uh, and then the opposition started to fight back on that. They'd be grabbing the rope, they'd be cutting the rope, they'd be fighting our people. Uh, and it was, you know, just an amazing thing to watch from the inside the embassy, this uh, scramble of battle uh, stopping us from getting food. It's amazing uh, to watch from out here, too. Uh, it's amazing to watch from out there, too. There were a lot of times that didn't actually succeed. There were a lot of attempts that didn't actually succeed. And, uh, and, and there were some attempts that were just like military maneuvers or football games or, you know, it was just amazing to watch. You know, we, there was one we threw the bag out over the opposition people into the street and our people would run up to, they'd do a fake to go that way. It was like watching a football scrimmage. It was just crazy to watch. Okay. Uh, and, and then there was one attempt uh, involved. How many people were next? 21. 21 people were involved at 3 in the morning uh, to get in food to us. And they had a diversion in front where they tried to attract the opposition people at night to go there. And they did attract some, and someone was very, one of our allies was very aggressively hurt that night, put into a chokehold, and uh, had some physical injuries. And he was the diversion. Uh, and then back at the, at the garage entrance, they had uh, blockaders to stop the coup people from getting to the the, the, the food, the food, the food uh, 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 Carrier. carriers, and they'd throw the food carriers over the side to the garage. We'd run out to grab the food, and this, and that was at 3 a.m. in the morning. And that night, we like doubled our food supply. It's like, wow, <laughs> so exciting. So, you know, at that point, we were being very careful, and not everybody was aware of what was going on because we thought we either had informants or that they were, the place was bugged. We were actually writing down our plans and keeping limited who knew about each specific project. Uh, and, uh, and so not everybody knew about it. We, we got this food, we came at three, and we were like, oh, we doubled our food. People started waking up and coming down. It was like so exciting, wow, food. We can, what was the first thing we ate? Was it, there, were, there were like things we hadn't eaten before. We, oh, we can have a whole bowl of oatmeal tonight, tomorrow. Wow, it's so exciting. Um, and, how about the cucumber missile? Oh, that, we had, that's another one. I'll tell about that in a second. Uh, and so that night we, we found a bottle of Russian out, no, no, of rum, rum. bottle of rum. And we, we, we said, oh, let's celebrate. So we brought the rum out and we poured the glasses. I said, it doesn't smell like rum. Uh, and we had already filled the bottle up with water because we, we were afraid that they were going to turn our water off, which they, which they eventually did. We, and, and so we, we thought we were going to celebrate and have some rum, but it turned out we just, it was just a bottle, a bottle of water. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't white rum. Uh, but you know, people, as you, as you mentioned, people tried to throw food up to us. Uh, one person threw up some lettuce uh, and some bananas and bread, and she was arrested for throwing a missile or, uh, at, at the building. Uh, the, 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 the president of Veterans for Peace, uh, Jerry Condon, uh, fantastic guy. Uh, he, he was there and he was trying to get food in. We were trying to do the throwing the thing out, but the goose supporters were blocking it, so he took a cucumber. He was going to throw a cucumber. Whoops. He was going to throw a cucumber up to me, and he was mugged by the police, pulled to the ground, face all scraped, and that was the last day. You'll see his picture in here. You'll see him with his yeah, scraped face. Uh, that was the last day the Secret Service was there. Uh, I think that was kind of the, they, they, that was such bad press to have a veteran. 72-year-old president of Veterans for Peace, thrown to the ground for trying to give us a cucumber. <laughs> you know, it was absurd. Uh, but and that was the end of the Secret Service, and it actually did somewhat get better after that for a short time. But that was because they were getting to their end game. So basically, why they allowed these coup supporters to surround us was because the Vienna Convention requires the U.S. government, as the host country, to protect foreign embassies. They're not allowed to go in those embassies uh, and without the permission of the, of the, the government, the foreign, the foreign ministry. Uh, and uh, they're not allowed to go in at all. And, and so uh, if they were to come in to get us, they'd be violating the Vienna Convention. So instead, they thought they'd terrorize us. And they had this, these pro-coup mobs that were expats from uh, Cuba, from Nicaragua, from Venezuela. Any country had a leftist country, people who had fled those uh, countries 
they were out there. And we were really pleased that Mint Press News did a great story on some of the uh, coup supporters and who they had military intelligence, uh, uh, they had military they, contractors, uh, yeah, the PR firms, lobbyists, it was really amazing. Yeah, but I was going to say that these, these were very well trained people. That's right. They were very student uprisings in Nicaragua and Venezuela and their whole SOS Venezuela, SOS Nicaragua. They were wearing the SOS t-shirts, some of them, and um, they were so skilled at uh, you know, looking like they're nonviolent. They always had their hands up, but then being able to assault people. And um, we were, our people were really good at being disciplined and not engaging with them because there was no engaging with them. We learned very quickly early on that they had no purpose to engage. They were only there to disrupt and to try to get us to, to get us, yeah, yeah, terrorize us, which they were pretty scary, um, especially trying to break in. One night, they were uh, they were banging on. There was like four or five of them taking, you know, frying pans and other things, and like banging on this wooden door and denting it. And if you, we have video of it from the inside. The door was like shaking, and we thought it might break because it, I mean they were literally doing this for hours on end. We were actually making plans. What are we going to do if, if they come? Hundred of these people come in, and we're in the embassy, stuck with them. Yeah. Uh, how are we going to deal? What are we, so we were making plans. And I leaned out the window. There's Secret Service literally standing there watching them. And I yelled at them, and I said, "They're damaging the embassy. Your job is to protect the embassy. Are you going to like take these people away?" And they wouldn't even look at me or talk to me. So. Our lawyer wrote a letter, sent it to the State Department. We quickly got the word out through social media. People called the State Department. Thanks. We called the State Department, and we were said, if the people come into the embassy, if they break through, are you going to guarantee our safety? And they wouldn't answer. They wouldn't say that they would even guarantee our safety. So at that point, we were pretty much like, okay, we're on our own. Uh, we're gonna have to do something to prevent them from coming in, and we, it was like Home Alone 2. We started scavenging the embassy for materials. There was a workshop up on the top floor with tools and rigging up wire and using weights from the weight room and four by fours when we could find them and basically securing all of the doors. And so then instead they broke in through the windows, literally. They broke the windows and, and came in that way. They had, they had already broken the garage door. The garage had both one of those doors that go oh, rock, okay. but also had a door that you open and shut, and they broke that door. Uh, and so, With a sledgehammer, they just took the doorknob right off so that it couldn't be locked or shut. And so we had to put up blockade there, and you saw some of these signs that we had these uh, placards outside, the imperialist checklist and such. We turned those signs into blockades of that door, and we, put, we were able to back a van up. One of the embassy uh, uh, vehicles was a van. We were able to back that up and keep that closed. But even then, they could sometimes get in. And so that was a major area of problem. Uh, and we also actually, speaking of vans, we actually cooked our, after the electricity was turned off, they, you saw a picture in here of them going into a manhole and turning our electricity off. When the electricity was turned off, we actually cooked our food while we charged our phones in the car. We would charge our phone in the car, and then we'd use the engine as a heater to cook our food, corn cakes. to cook corn cakes. Uh, and on the roof, we had a solar cooker. Uh, and as this was all going on, once the electricity was turned, we also got worried about the water. And as I mentioned, we filled the, everything we could find, every bottle, every trash can was lined with plastic filled with water. We had so much water prepared when they turned the water off. Uh, so we were, you But know, we were limiting ours. We were having two meals a day. Once they cut off the food, we decided that we would have two meals a day. Uh, young people got to eat more than the older people, you know, um, small portions. Because they have a higher metabolism right. and burn more energy. And uh, one That was a big debate, by the way. Yeah. You know, Mark, Mark has said, I'm a doctor, they need more food. <laughs> well, the only guy says, wait, wait, what do you mean? That's a big, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we were literally uh, limiting ourselves to a liter of water a day. No flushing the toilets, you know, a little, little bit to wash up with, that kind of thing. Uh, we, we created a makeshift bathroom in the garage directly into a drain, <laughs> so that worked. Um, on the, on the, night, the night before we got arrested, one of our the final four actually built a toilet in the, bat, in the garage. He got all these bricks, lined them up, he had found a, a broken toilet seat, took that apart and put it out as a toilet. It had a, a trash can that was lined that he could pull out and empty. Uh, we, unfortunately, we were arrested that next morning, so we never got a chance to use this fantastic toilet. Uh, but he, uh, there was a lot of creativity uh, uh, going on uh, to survive uh, in, in the embassy. Uh, 
Yeah, we should open up the question. I'll be, if you watch these films, uh, pictures, I'll be able to get some questions from those as well. Okay. Well, that's, thank you. Open it up more formally now, and, and uh, minor rules. Uh, I'm sure with this audience, is not going to be uh, any problems or anything. But we're going to try to uh, call on everybody uh, at least once that hasn't had a chance to speak before we call on people a second time. Uh, there's really uh, no particular boundaries in the discussion. No, it's an open discussion. There's a lot of big, uh, important issues that are raised here. Uh, uh, at the forum tonight, so any questions you have, don't feel that they're off limits. You know, we want to have an open discussion. Venezuela, Cuba, U.S. policy at this point, these are very... Uh, Hong Kong. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> really, there's uh, anything people want to raise, uh, we'll have a discussion back and forth, and, and I'll try to make sure it goes smoothly. So, we'll start right over here. It seems that what the American government is trying to do with medicine Venezuela is very similar to what the Israelis are doing with medicine in Gaza. Just trying to make sure that people just don't have access to adequate medicine or medical care or spare parts. I think these kinds of tactics we see everywhere now. This mm -hmm. is like Iran, Iran also. I mean, you see these kinds of U.S. tactics. And what's interesting about William the Embassy, when they turned our electricity off, we thought about the people in Caracas. Because we were in Caracas when the U.S. turned off electricity there. When they blocked our food, we thought about the sanctions that blocked food into Venezuela, because they're doing that in Venezuela. Uh, water supplies, when the electricity were off, the water pumps go off. That happened in, our, in the embassy as well. Uh, and so we lost our water. So we felt like we were a small version of the same kinds of U.S. attacks that people of Venezuela, people of Gaza, people of Iran, people of Nicaragua. This is a co these are common tactics. And they're so interesting, they're using them against us in Georgetown. It's very weird there. It was very weird being under siege in the middle of Georgetown. Yeah. I mean, just I'd like to say something about that also, because this is a very important point. The other side of that, though, is these sanctions, as I think we all know now, they are becoming more openly and consciously vicious. Yes. This is what uh, they are, this estimate of the number of deaths, this is all bearing down now. But the other side of that is, is that this really, I mean, we're seeing a lot of suffering and death and malnutrition and everything. So, so. You know, but so in a sense, you have to almost have a cold-blooded, objective view of this thing. But in reality, politically, this is these are things that are being done out of weakness. I think, yes. on the part of U.S. policy, this is what they are left with. Their policy is reduced to just imposing sanctions, and this is it's it's not in this political framework how sustainable that is going to be is something that, that we will see. But it is because they know they couldn't. They tried to create the conditions in Venezuela, as they've been trying to do to, in Cuba for almost 60 years now, to create the conditions for direct US intervention. Nobody in their right mind thought for two seconds that Juan Guaido was going to just, as a result of some internal pressure in Venezuela, land in Miraflores. That was absurd, and I don't think anybody, except maybe Guaido, you know, actually uh, uh, believed that. So it was all a question of could the conditions for U.S. military intervention be created? They tried, but they well, were they're still they're trying. trying. They, they are still that's trying. That's what the terrorism is about. Yes. Uh, and I'll just mention on Gaza, by the way, we just did a fantastic interview. Uh, with, for our, our radio show, Clearing the Fog, which you can see on popularresistance.org or listen on WBAI. We just got <coughs> on BAI this week. It's on every Tuesday after Democracy Now. Uh, Abby Martin has a great uh, film out. Uh, yeah. Gaza Fights for Its Freedom. An amazing, uh, and she's going to do a tour, by the way. Her and her Gaza partner, Mike Prasner. Pr Pr fight. yeah. Gaza Fights for Its Freedom. Uh, and uh, I'd recommend if you're doing a film series on, on Gaza, this is a film you should definitely bring here. Uh, they're going to start doing a national tour. If you want me to put in touch with her, I'd be happy to do so. It's a great interview. It's a great, great film. Okay. Uh, all the way in the back. Who is in the embassy now? Right now it's empty. Uh, they did a photo op uh, for Carlos Vecchio, who is the uh, ambassador, the you know Guaido appointed fake ambassador. Uh, he was able to go in, get a picture taken at the window, 
you know, wave to the crowd. There was no crowd, but wave like he's waving to the crowd uh, and make it look like, but right now it's empty, uh, which I think is a very good thing. Thank goodness it's not being used. We fear to be used as a place to organize the coup, uh, which is ongoing, the coup. And Vecchio is interesting because he comes out of the oil business, first of all. Grayson has a great bio of Vecchio. Grayson's own project is some of the best reporting on these kinds of situations. And he had a great story about Vecchio. But uh, he's also being investigated now by the Department of Justice uh, for embezzling $70 million <laughs> from CITCO. Uh, so that's the kind of guy who's and the... And Vecchio also, the popular will party, the Leopoldo Lopez party that Juan Guaido came from, Vecchio was the chief operations officer. So, you know, Lopez was in jail for inciting violence, and they, you know, the opposition was responsible for killing over 100 Venezuelans in these guarimbas, these blockades, uh, taking people that they thought were Chavista, burning them alive. That means if you're, if, you're, if you're black, if you're an Afro-Venezuelan, uh, they, they assumed you're Chavista, it. and there were nine actually burned alive. Yeah. They tried to kill 28 that way. They, they actually did kill They had mine. a wire they put across the road because mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of people, they call them the colectivos, mm -hmm. they ride their motorbikes and they would mm -hmm. actually decapitate mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. So he, Lopez, was in jail for basically organizing that. Vecchio was the operations officer. He made it happen. And he actually had to flee Venezuela because he would be in, in jail right now if he were actually in Venezuela. And he's their foreign minister. It's like <laughs> and he began his career, I think, in the original coup in yeah. 2002, yeah. a lot of these folks have he been, yeah. was organized riots yeah. that were extremely violent to try to burn down the Cuban embassy in Venezuela. But one of my favorite moments was um, oh yeah, we had some good times with that Cuba. May first, uh, <laughs> we thought that the day after their attempted coup, we thought they were going to try to come in to the, take the embassy. There was this big deal. Becky was going to have this big press conference in front of the embassy, and we thought for sure that they would try to come in. So well, he even brought, he even brought like a, a, a thing here. Oh, yeah, he had seals. He was going to put his new seal on the embassy and everything. <laughs> and so it had the front doors had this like brick patio, and almost like a stage with stairs going up to it. And so we're inside the front lobby, and we've got our signs, you know. We're shouting them down. And we're like, fist. We're <laughs> shouting them down. And he was looking really scared, which was funny, but um, he starts his press conference and he starts to speak with his microphone. They brought a loudspeaker, but we actually had access to the electrical box. So as soon as he started speaking, we shut the power. Uh, <laughs> and then he, so, so he left. Then he, then he started to flee down the street. Uh, and Anya, uh, Anya was following. Oh, she was outside. Anya was outside at that was point. Like, Becky, Becky. And she was following him and she, are you going to the White House now, Carlos? <laughs> <laughs> and he was like running away. It was, it was such a fantastic uh, up instead and she was like, well, we're seeking a legal means for evicting them from the embassy. And so we're like, mm -hmm. We're still there for several more weeks. But then every time he came back, we just shouted them down and we had a radio show going, the Embassy Protection Oh my radio God, that was so fantastic. And this radio really show. talented guy who was just making up, like we were playing, you know, pro Chavista, pro socialist songs <laughs> and the pro coup people hated them. And and then he we was had loud, big loud speakers from the windows, yeah. and uh, he was making up new songs, you know, like another coup bites the dust, and another coup bites the dust. And then he did a whole, he did a whole monologue going through all of the U.S. coup attempts through the history of Latin America, yeah. uh, which was a very long. How long were there? Thirty-seven days. That was a long, <laughs> that was a long, that was a long, that was a great show. Until so they radio shut our power off, we had a lot of fun with that every evening. And when the power went out, we could keep that up. Uh, did you have a question over here? The back? Yeah, uh, what happened to uh, CITCOs? All the CITCOs in the United States, does Venezuela still get the money? No, and, no. And no. figures. And is that, they're all gone. Well, basically, okay. yeah, the U.S. seized all the CITCO and CITCO's yeah. assets, but there's an interesting thing, and Anya Perimple has a new article about so this. Before you get to that, to that yeah. let's just say the CITCO assets now are being taken by the U.S. government. And given. And Margaret mentioned how there are these efforts on terrorist attacks. U.S. put a billion dollars uh, into Colombia from stolen assets from Venezuela That's to pay it. for paramilitary oh. to commit terrorism in Venezuela. Yeah. Yeah. And Bank of America uh, 
transferred that money from the U.S. to Colombia just in case. Now, we don't hear that in the media here at all. Yeah. It's known in the Latin American media, but we don't hear about this. And part of that terror, I'll just let you tell yeah. Anya's story in a second, but the part of that terror, Israeli Defense Forces, 100 troops were in Colombia you know, just two weeks ago preparing to go in to commit terrorism in Venezuela. Yeah. So the, what uh, Anya discovered, she was recently down in Venezuela, and um, so it was this Canadian mining company called Crystalex that was kicked out of Venezuela, and they were trying to get money for you know whatever their losses. So they sued Venezuela in the United States to use assets, Venezuelan assets in the U.S. to pay them off, and the U.S. ruled in their favor. But that would only work if Citco was actually a, a government institution, and under the Maduro government, they had it set up with about five or six different layers of separation between the governance of CITGO and the government so that it actually wasn't a government institution and, and they couldn't take that money. Well, Guaido, the idiot, takes Carlos Vecchio, right, puts him in charge of this, and they appoint three people, they're the government now, they appoint the three leaders of CITGO. So now Guaido has taken CITGO and turned it into a government Body. He's such a socialist for a neoliberal. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and so now that mining company is going to be able to take billions of dollars of assets from Citgo, and people are saying this could be the end of, of Citgo, but this is just, you know, his, you know, he's not a bright guy. It's just, <laughs> <laughs> that's an understatement. Oh. Right away. Um, did you have a I, I was going to, but if there's somebody no, else. No, no, go ahead. And then um, I'll call it's you. It's kind of a, a strange and unsightly thing worked out with the question, that's exactly. Um, the, it's just been announced, the US government is going to be the biggest producer of oil in the world. That's right. right. the new Middle East, I call it to us the Midwest. Right, Middle 61% West. of new. And, and so, what I'm kind of wondering, are they trying to just shut down any kind of small competition with this? I mean, the oil company, it's the oil countries that they keep or what, what exactly, what is the power thing that they're trying to I don't think it's about the oil personally. I mean, even though the US, no. Venezuela is number, say, number, yeah. number one in oil reserves, number five in gas reserves, is number one in diamonds, number one in gold. It has a lot of minerals that are essential for electronics and for weapons. Okay. The U.S. does not have that. Okay. The U.S. actually relies on China for those minerals now. Okay. That's not tenable. That's not rare rare, that, yeah. and China is not... A reliable source when there are major focus of foreign policy. Oh, I'm happy it's a and so, but I, so I think it's a combination of the rare earth minerals used for weapons and electronics, but also it's the, of course, the example that in Venezuela before in you know, the first uh, illegal course measures were under George Bush in 2004, and then President Obama declared Venezuela a national security threat and escalated those sanctions, and then Trump has escalated them further. Uh, and before all that happened, and before the oil prices dropped from more than 150 a barrel to about 50 a barrel, Venezuela had a lot of money. It was using that money to lift its people up in an amazing way. The figures on literacy and poverty and housing are just, and still, they're still, even with the economic war, they're still doing that. Uh, but uh, the, uh, since that crash, uh, it's been more difficult. And so it's, Venezuela is still an example of a country that's thumbing its nose in the United States, just like Iran is, right. just like Cuba is, right. uh, just like Nicaragua is. So you look at the foreign policy said, of yeah. Nicaragua, they're allied with Cuba, they're allied with Venezuela, they're allied with you know, all the, uh, Russia, with all the anti-US, the US competition. So I don't think it's as much about the oil and gas, because the US right now, thanks to President Obama, uh, as he proudly told uh, yeah. Texas oil executives, I'm the one who made us number one in the world. Uh, for oil uh, and gas. I'm the fossil fuel president. Uh, and so I don't think it's about the oil as much anymore. I think it's more about geopolitical positioning and I think those rare earth minerals. But shutting, shutting down the oil is critical because that's where Venezuela is basically an oil-based economy. They, they would like to diversify, but you can't do that overnight. And so that was their major source of US dollars that they could then use to buy things. And so doing an embargo on that has hurt their ability. 92% 90, of their foreign currency came from oil. And so you shut down oil. And I think that there's evidence that that oil price drop was a manipulation uh, to not just hurt Venezuela, but also Russia, uh, also a big major producer. So there's a lot of questions about what, that hasn't really been 
uh, investigate it thoroughly enough or report it thoroughly, thoroughly enough yet, but I think it will be. But on uh, August 6th, the day after President Trump's you know, executive order blockade, uh, I think it was Bolton, was down in Lima, Peru, and uh, talking, I guess it was the Lima group that was meeting there, and they were talking about you know, what's next for Venezuela, like the future of Venezuela, and they were so open about it. They basically were like, you know, we're gonna privatize, we're gonna like, bring in all this business, and so it's really obvious that that was, you know, Venezuela was a wealthy nation, and although there was extreme poverty and wealth inequality, um, and they want to return back to that day. They want to reverse the social programs and privatize and monetize, and, you know. If I can profit. just also add something to that. Um, it's also true that the, the other side of that, the fluctuations, for example, in commodity prices uh, that really stepped up after the 2008, 2009 crash and all of these things, uh, these were things that are totally out of the control of the, uh, 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 of, of the Venezuelan government or any other government. But at the same time, um, because they were integrated into the world capitalist economy, that they were vulnerable when the oil prices crashed. It was on the basis of that, and that was more or less the policy. If you read the early interviews with, uh, with Chavez, you know, he said he was against neoliberal capitalism, savage capitalism. Uh, you know, the idea was to sort of have, in a third world context, I guess, sort of a left Keynesian approach, that you would have a mixed economy, that you would take advantage of high commodity prices, and this was, speaks highly of them, that they would use that for educational programs, for medical care, to raise uh, extreme poverty, I think, in the first few years of the Venezuelan government, went from something like 40 percent. No, 75 percent. Well, I mean, Man, that's, a, that's, a, that's that general was, poverty. They had, they had another oh, extreme, right, of extreme, extreme, extreme right. poverty that that's was right. about 38 yeah, yeah, percent. Right. That right. went that's down right. to about 11 or 12 percent. So there were tremendous, and Cuba played a major role in providing the, the, the forces that could do that, that would go into communities that had never seen a doctor. But at the, at the same time, that it shows the limits of, of that, that perspective because you're still on the, on the uh, you're, you're, it's still the economy, and then that doesn't even talk, the capitalist class inside Nicaragua, although many of them hedged their bets and got homes in Miami and all of that stuff, at the same time, they still controlled distribution. Right. Very important, yeah. retail, trade, holes, millions of ways to sabotage that. So when that crash came, it sort of, it led to that and then that led to other things. And the U.S. took advantage of that vulnerability. Now today, in my opinion, the defense of Venezuelan sovereignty and the right to self-determination has to lie through the defense of the Maduro government, whatever mistakes it, it made or, had, or people think it's made. I have my opinions on that, you know, people can disagree. And inside Venezuela, within the camp of the Bolivarian process, there's lots of disagreements. But the point is, is that this is now shown, because in Argentina, a similar process is happening with a, an infinitely less progressive government. So even right-wing capitalist governments, when they come up against these laws of the world market, it makes them vulnerable. Cuba shows a different road, distinctly. We spoke with a young woman activist, and she basically said, you know, we're trying to move to socialism, but we're trying to do it in, through a democratic, you know, process. So they see it, they call it the Bolivarian process, because they don't, they see it as a vision of where they want to be, but they're trying to get there by creating these really deep democratic structures within the country of the community councils and then the community councils joining together for regional councils. And then they have representation in the National Constituent Assembly, which is actually the highest body in the land above pres you know, the presidency. And so, you know, it's, you can't just snap your fingers and change your whole economy. But there are a lot of people in Venezuela pressuring for more, more socialism. socialism. Especially as the sanctions happen, people are saying, well, take that property to pay for that. Take that capitalist over. You know, it's a lot of aggression. Uh, we met with the Communist Party in, uh, when we were in Venezuela, and they're very strongly pushing for a more uh, left movement because still 70% of the economy of Venezuela is capitalist. The guy in the back was the, the, uh, Go ahead. Um, real quick question, actually. Um, what do you expect would have happened if? 
um, in response to the coup supporters trying to break into the embassy, who had responded with some type of violence. If we had. Yes, from within the embassy, not your supporters. So, well, that speaking of self-defense. Speaking of self <laughs> something with a, history, with a military history background, if you had poured oil and water on the swine, we never even discussed the door. <laughs> but what do you think might have happened? Or was it, you, you didn't discuss it. Did your lawyers ever discuss it? Or was there ever any discussion? I mean, we did nonviolence trainings while we were in there. Okay. Um, and we were very disciplined. Our people knew not to engage with them, um, knew to stay nonviolent, because we were surrounded by M, you know, Metropolitan Police, Secret Service, other federal agents were out there with guns. We saw how they were working with the pro coup people. If we had responded back with violence, that would have given them the justification. That would have been suicide by police. Exactly. It would have been, would have been moved. Yeah. I think we would be having a, a defense committee we, meeting to get them out of jail. Oh, we, or we could or, or just to come to our burial and yeah. celebrate our anniversary of our yeah. death. These people were serious. <laughs> these were these military trained people who were very serious about what they were doing and, and very angry at us for being in there. This sister right here and then John. I was just curious, what was the triggering event for them to finally come in and arrest you? Well, that's a great, I know we didn't discuss that, I wish we had. Yeah. Uh, I think the triggering event was Jesse Jackson. Yeah. Well, it was, it was a series of things. It was that we were starting to have more of our supporters out there than the pro-coup supporters, and the media was starting to come to cover us. If we had, got, if we had broken through the media, oh my God, it would have been, that would have just yeah. gigantically exploded. Uh, but then Jesse Jackson showed up. Uh, and Jesse Jackson uh, brought some media with him. He promised to come back with more clergy. On more, Sunday. On, on Sunday. Yeah, on Wednesday. And then he uh, was also involved in helping us to get food into the embassy. There's a picture in there, but yeah. there's a great video of uh, Jammu Baraka, the vice presidential candidate for the Green Party, uh, fighting with coup supporters, trying to pull them away from our food so we could get the food up uh, that Jesse Jackson was helping, uh, Jesse, Jesse was helping us get in. And um, I think we got four bags of food in that day. And First produce we'd had in weeks. Bananas, <laughs> yeah, it was fantastic, and banana. Uh, and and uh, so I think that the government realized, uh-oh, there's only Things four of them. They got four bags of new food. They said, no, we, we had, what happened is a picture also in there of the police coming a few days before they actually arrested us. They came in, they uh, came, to the door. came to the front door, cut the locks off the door, Open the door. We were waiting in the vestibule for them. We weren't going to resist the police if they were going to arrest us. We were the last four in there, and they uh, said, "Will you voluntary come?" We said, "No." Well, they said they had an eviction notice. Right. right? Oh my God. So their eviction notice was printed on blank, blank paper, no heading, no, no, no letter, <laughs> no agency. It just basically said Juan Guaido is in head, the head of this, and he tells you you can't be here anymore, so you have to leave. And they said, "Will you leave voluntarily?" And we said, no, we are here legally. If you walk through that door, you are violating the law. <laughs> and so we're not leaving. We had like a 45 minute exchange where Kevin and I explained all the political and global implications of them violating the Vienna Convention. We talked about, you know, a year from now, if there are US Embassy personnel killed, remember you were the one who violated the Vienna Convention. And if this escalates between a mil to, into a military conflict with Venezuela, Remember that China and Russia are on the side of Venezuela. <laughs> and your coming into this vestibule violating international law could lead to that escalation to a geopolitical conflict that's global. You want to tell your grandchildren that you violated international law and started World War III? <laughs> and, and we said to them, uh, we suggest you go back to your superiors and talk about this. And tell them to rethink this. Think about it. Uh, because it's a, and so the guy who was talking to us after about 45 minutes, he left. Another guy took his place. We had another half hour conversation with him, uh, making a lot of the same points again. And we hope that there's a police video of this. <laughs> we haven't seen this video cam yet. We've got, we've got 800 police video cams as part of our discovery so far. We haven't seen this one yet, but I hope hopefully, it's, it's in there. hopefully it's in there. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so he, then he, after we talked another half hour with the next guy, he came back probably from talking to his superiors and said, we decided we're gonna leave. <laughs> and and they, they said, we're gonna leave now. And we're going to lock the doors behind us. If you want, we'll leave some police here. If you want to leave, just knock on the door and they'll let, they'll let you out. So they put zip ties on the front door. The, the staff had put chains on the front door when they broke diplomatic relations. And they cut those. They put zip ties. So they went back and got a judge to sign an arrest warrant. 
And that Wednesday was when Jesse came, and the Thursday was when they decided that morning to come in. And so they could have gone and cut the zip ties and walked in the front door and taken us out. But instead, they brought scores. More than 100 police yeah. from five different police agencies. <laughs> wearing, they were wearing military gear, heavy weapons, with a battering ram, band, trying to batter the door down. The whole building was shaking from it. And we were upstairs on the second floor waiting for them calmly. Uh, and uh, we, oh, we also, we also went, ran around. We had made these um, uh, playing cards, you know, so we could play card games at night from business cards. Oh. And so we, we, we went around and made sure we picked up those so we could take them as a souvenir. Uh, we, so we, got we were also eating a lot of the food because we were like, oh, All this great food had arrived. So we were, we were <laughs> saving all this great food and we couldn't eat it, so we had to eat a bunch of food. <laughs> so, waiting for the police to come in. There were about seven, we, had, so we were in a conference room. There's a picture of the conference room. I was working in there, you can see it. There's a conference room and uh, 17 cops plus the four of us and they come in to arrest us. Margaret gives them a long monologue about what they're doing and how terrible it is. And, uh, they looked very ashamed, I will tell you. None, they weren't even wearing their identification either. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so they, they could, that was like 8.30 in the morning. They could have taken us to the magistrate, uh, and the magistrate meets at 1.30, so there's a lot of time. They decided instead to take a slow route to make sure we spent the night in jail. Mm. Uh, and so we went to a, first a lockup, uh, uh, second district, uh, then we went down to Central Booking, spent the night there, and then didn't get to the magistrate until 1.30 the next day. No, it was like 4.30. They, we could, they, like one of the they could have done that, you know, the same day. They decided to make it more than the John. Yeah, when you were in um, Venezuela, did you get to visit the new housing that has been built? And can you talk a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, the social housing. They built over 2 million units of social housing just under President Maduro. And so literally, like, you drive through Caracas, you can't find homeless people. Even we were out late at night, I was um, even driving around and you can't find them. And the social housing is also has programs with it, so um, child care programs. They have this amazing urban agriculture program. Um, they have a minister of popular power of urban agriculture, and she's really awesome. We met with her. And um, they get 25% of their food now from urban agriculture. Yes, yeah, the produce. And so, they, she works with a lot of youth, teaching them how to grow food. It's all non-GMO, no pesticides, and they basically have roof gardens. They have plazas that they've turned into gardens. People's balconies. Well, you meet people, and one of the first things they want to show you is their balcony garden, you know, and, and in their phones, their pictures of that. They're very proud of trying to develop their own food. And so two million, house, two million housing for the poorest, I include, by the way, a lot of Colombians who have fled the violence in Colombia. Uh, they get free housing with uh, all Support the, programs uh, with the, all the all the uh, refrigerator, etc. You know, full full housing set up, furniture and everything, and uh, two million housing. And that's for eight million people out of a population of thirty million. And then the CLAP program, which is their food distribution program, six million um, a month uh, for about fifteen cents a box, uh, pennies to fifteen cents a box. For the basics, pasta, flour, etc., for your kitchen. Cleaning supplies. Six million, produce. six million a month. That's for a family of four. That's 24 million out of 30 million people. And so when the U.S. went through this whole nonsense wow. about humanitarian aid, and Venezuela saying we're giving out, so, so like you know, 24 far. million people are getting every month getting humanitarian aid. What are you, you saying? This phony humanitarian. We don't need your humanitarian aid. Yeah. Uh, and so even with this economic war, that's making it so hard for Venezuela. They are putting the population first. And that's why the opposition can't win an election. They can't win an election because, first off, when they had power, they were, they, they were very violent. We told you about the Grumpas. One, one of the first things they did when they had this very fluky election, I'm glad to talk about, when the right wing won the National Assembly, yeah. one of the first things they did, in addition to taking out Simon Boulevard's photo, a, a big Chavez's picture, photo. and Chavez's picture, one of the first laws they passed was a law uh, and to give them amnesty for the crimes they've been committing since 2000, uh, since Chavez was elected. And they went through pages of the crimes <laughs> in, in the legislation. And, 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 and were giving themselves amnesty. 
for the crimes they were committing, terrorism, uh, you know, hi hiding food supplies, <laughs> housing, housing, all the stuff that we know they were doing, and they admitted it in legislation. And then the Supreme Court said, uh, you can't actually do that. That's unconstitutional. <laughs> uh, and, and, and the National Assembly has been, National Assembly has been defunct almost since it was founded for various, uh, elected for right. various reasons that we can explain if you want. Yeah. But it, the opposition can't win elections against who they are, plus their racism, burning Afro-Venezuelans, you know, the wire on the fence, all the, and, and, and really smart, Maduro was so smart about how he responded to these Garambas. What he did was he pulled back his troops and let, the, let, let them be themselves, and the community turned against them, because the community, to go home, had to pay a toll to get past the roadblock. And so even communities that were open to criticizing Maduro, they lost them. They lost them. Uh, their violence, their, their, their taking money, their disruption, and Maduro pulled back. And Maduro pulled back because what was happening, and this is the same thing happened in Nicaragua, same thing happening in Hong Kong, is you'd have these protesters who were very violent, attacking the police, the police would respond, you know, just like oh, reaction violence, uh, and they get the video of the police being violent, they put out the social media saying, uh, dictator Maduro, Repressive. authoritarian, attacking nonviolent protesters with violence. And we see that in Nicaragua, same thing in Hong Kong, same, same lie. Uh, and so Maduro <coughs> pulled back his, his, his forces so they wouldn't get those videos, let them have their roadblock. Who cares? Uh, and, they, and they did the same thing in, in Nicaragua after all, too, by the way. Uh, and, and that really, back at first, there were people who were allies of Maduro <coughs> who thought he was crazy. Why oh, you got, got to protect us from these people? But in the end, that was a really smart move. The combination of that, the amnesty law, taking down Simon Boulevard, you know, all of the. They've also openly said they would get rid of the Constitution, and they use a seven-star flag because the eighth star was added when the new Constitution was put in place. This is a very popular Constitution. People carry around the little books with the Constitution in it. So that's. Like we have a picture in our, our in our house that we're storing for the embassy of uh, Hugo Chavez reading the Constitution to children. Uh, <laughs> right over here. Um, yes. Thank you. It was so inspiring to watch it from the um, online day after day. It was just amazing to watch it. Thank you. So really, totally, totally much appreciation. I also <coughs> want to say that I just came from the Justice for Edson Thevenin demonstration in downtown Troy that a lot of, a lot of Trojans know about. It was a protest against a police a cover up of, of a police killing in Troy. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk, just say a minute about the, about the two sides, the way that the international, about the way that international resistance and our domestic resistance are two sides of the same coin. Yes. And that we haven't, on both sides, we haven't been able to realize that in a practice. And so the, true. the path to success, the path to victory, really lies through making those connections. This is this is not a criticism. This comes, we agree, we it, agree. It comes totally from both sides. Yeah. And we have it in the in the anti racism movement, the anti police violence movement, the anti incarceration movement. We have not we have very little been able to bring in internationalism into it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's it's the same in the international and global movements against the US global hegemony. Yeah, so it's not okay. it's not actually a, a moment when we can act, think about that in, in in a detailed practice, but I just wanted to raise it because we need a vision of victory. Oh, I just want to say one more thing about it, which is that those of us who are old enough to remember saw that happen in the movements of the late 60s and exactly. 70s. The place, the place where that where domestic anti-racist anti black liberation <coughs> movement um, was in sync with the anti-imperialist movement. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, there's a model for us. We agree. We agree. Let her well, respond here. There's a model for us in yeah. thinking about how we yeah. did that in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. I did want to, it's on the last slide, but just quickly before time runs out, let you know about um, something that we've been organizing that we started organizing as soon as we were released from our arrest. Uh, mm -hmm. The Embassy Protection Collective started putting together what we call the People's Mobilization to Stop the U.S. War Machine and Save the Planet or we just call it the People's Mob, the 50th anniversary of the People's Mob against Vietnam is coming up this November. And uh, we're gonna have four days of action in New York City, September 20th to the 23rd. You can go to peoplesmob.org and see everything there. Uh, but 
part, we have kind of two different focus, you know, focus line or whatever for that. For that. One is there's a lot of climate stuff happening then. The People's Climate Strike is Friday, and there's a UN Climate Summit on Monday. So we're making connections with the climate movement because we think there need to be stronger, you know, connections between the anti-war and the climate movement. So we're supporting the Young People's uh, Strike, People's Strike, and our organizers have been going to their meetings. Saturday we were going to have our march because that's the International Peace Day, but there's been a group of Puerto Rican organizations that have been organizing a Puerto Rican Independence March for over a year, and we didn't want to conflict with that, so we're supporting that as well. And then on Sunday in Herald Square at 2 o'clock we're having our rally and then a march to the United Nations. Um, Roger Waters is coming. He was really supportive of us when we went to embassy. He did a solidarity video with us when our power was turned off. Um, others are going to be there as well, um, and then we'll do a march after that. And then on Monday night, we're having an evening event at a church near the United Nations called A Path to International Peace, realizing the vision of the United Nations Charter. Because you may be aware that the non-aligned movement, when they met in Caracas this July, put forward the Caracas Charter, which says that all of these things, the unilateral coercive measures, the interference in politics of other countries, and the military aggression are all in violation of the Charter. And the United States needs to be held accountable for its violations of international law, not just the Vienna Convention, but leaving the nuclear treaty, leaving the Iran, you know, JCPOA, leaving the Paris Climate Agreement. So, um, so we've been talking for a long time about building an international popular movement or network to support those same goals of holding the United States accountable, of you know, making people aware of the impacts of these, of these measures, and also organizing to try to provide some mutual aid to overcome some of the impacts of these measures. And so we released something called the Global Appeal for Peace. And people have been signing on from all around the world, and that's a first step towards that. So this Monday night event is going to be about having representatives of countries that are impacted by U.S. policy talking about those impacts, as well as civil society groups talking about what we're doing and having a discussion about next steps, about how we can organize. And then we may deliver that appeal to the United Nations the next day. So all of that is on peoplesmove.org. If you want to come to the night event on Monday, because we're having officials from these countries, we are requiring that people register in advance. It's a free event, but we will have security there, and you do have to register if you want to attend that. Um, so, and then, so all that's there. And then also, there's a defense committee that's been formed for us, the Embassy Protection Defense Committee, because we, um, the government has made it pretty clear that they want to punish us. They didn't really offer us a plea agreement. They offered us a plea guilty and you can have up to a year in prison and up to a $100,000 fine and we can also make you pay for the police time and all that other stuff. So, wow. um, so we have a defense committee, a defense team, a legal defense team, and uh, we need to pay them. And so um, the defense committee is raising money, but they're also we don't want this to become about us and our legal defense. If we serve time in jail, we serve time in jail. I mean, I would never take back what I did at the embassy. But um, but we want the defense committee is also using it as a mechanism to to educate people about what's happening in Venezuela and demand that we stop the sanctions and you know, stop the aggression. I think we're gonna. Pass a uh, pocket bucket. around. So please, uh, <laughs> have any loose any 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 generously. And by the way, you know, we, we for uh, defend, uh, defend embassyprotectors.org, if you want to check it out on the website, how to get involved in the mobilizing around our trial. And there's a petition to sign to drop the charges. So, we, by the way, to respond to your question also, for years on the peace movement side, we've been calling about end wars at home and abroad. Because the war at home, the militarization of the police, the police killings, the police violence, that's the war at home. And so we've been, United National Anti-War Coalition, Veterans for Peace, Popular Resistance, Black Alliance for Peace, we've all been using that kind of language to try to link those issues, because we think uniting movements, you know, we, 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 when we organized Occupy uh, back in 2011, it was all about uniting movements. Uh, and that's, I think, where we get our strength, so I totally agree with you. This brother right here. Oh, you. You. Uh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was just uh, a bit perplexed why the European nation seems to kowtow so much to the Trump administration. How many troops do we have in Germany? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's really interesting because um, there was an interesting article in Bloomberg last week that talked about kind of the awkwardness of the diplomatic situation where governments 
ambassadors have to recognize Guaido's people, but then they're actually doing their business with Maduro's people. And and it admitted how like Spain is, you know, says they recognize Guaido, but they they didn't ever change their relationship with the Maduro government. And it's an interesting situation in Germany because the uh, German ambassador, what did he do in Venice? Oh, Juan Guaido came home from his regime change tour to Venezuela, uh -huh. and the German ambassador went to the airport to greet him. And so the Maduro government was like, well, that's over the line, and they said, you're out of here. And the German government basically, after a couple weeks, said, go back there and work with the Maduro government. So, um, so I think. The, the gist of the Bloomberg article is this, can't, this is not really sustainable, and these European countries are going to have to recognize that he is the legitimate president. And when the power was off, the French embassy contacted the Maduro government and said, can you get our power back on? <laughs> they were tempted to say, why don't you ask why <laughs> and the Trump, even, even the Trump administration is negotiating with the Maduro government. Yeah. Uh, when the Caracas embassy was closed, when the U.S. embassy was closed, Switzerland was going to be the protecting power for the U.S. embassy. Turkey was going to be the protecting power for the embassy in Georgetown for Venezuela. And the, the idea was to have a mutual protecting power agreement. So the U.S. embassy was protected in Caracas, and the Venezuelan embassy was protected in Georgetown. Uh, and so they were negotiating with the Maduro government for protecting power, and while saying he's not the president. And then Elliot Abrams was asked uh, at a press conference, because uh, under, the, under the Constitution, there can be an interim president if the president is disabled. Uh, not able to serve. Uh, not able to serve, removed from office, whatever. There can be a, a, an interim president from the National Assembly. But after si 60 days, 30 days, there has to be an election. And so the press asked, well, it's been three days. Where is the election? And the Elliot Elliot Abrams says, well, the problem is Maduro's still in power. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, so it's a very confused, because it's all a lie. I could just say one thing. Your, your question raises something very important. In my opinion, the next big political shoe to drop in this whole unfolding, ongoing debacle mm -hmm. is bound to be the disintegration of this Lima group right. thing that was set up right. when they were at their high point. You know, they got all these servile governments, many of whom now, as you were saying, they want what they got into. This is not sustainable. The disintegration of the Lima group lags behind what's already happened on the ground. Uh, and as, as that situation develops, um, you're going to start to see defections. And again, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, this is in the context of already the turmoil and the deepening class struggles that are developing in uh, Latin America as a whole and Central America and the Caribbean and all of these things. It, it, is, it, it was exacerbated by this debacle and is still going to play out. They have a problem. The, the high point of the anti-Venezuela crusade is long past. You know, and now, they, they, whether they like it or not, they have to turn to these other major crises before there's even a synchronized world economic downturn, which 99% of capitalist economists say is just a matter of time. You know, uh, they've had this artificially sustained 10-year expansion. And when that comes, the turn, but already before that's even happened, the Argentine peso has crashed completely. The IMF brilliantly loaned Argentina another $60 billion right before the <laughs> thing crashed. That's a Mexico, the Mexican border, Honduras, uh, Brazil. Oh, Come on, Brazil with Bolsonaro and all of these things. You know, all of these are, 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 are giant political problems for U.S. policy in this period under the leadership of the illustrious and, and Donald the OAS. Trump. I mean, Luisa Magros, his own party kicked him out because they're so embarrassed by him. That had the <laughs> OAS. And countries literally walked out of the meetings and protested right. the votes. So there's a lot of division in there as well. When they started to do the intervention, well, when, the, when the Lima group people, especially the, some of the Europeans and the Canadians, when they started to see that the real purpose of the Lima group was to give cover for a coup and a military intervention, they, they start saying, no, 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 no. Yeah. Our main thing is to oppose U.S. military intervention, yeah. even as they were still formally signed up to say to try to legitimize Guaido. So this is unviable. It's unsustainable. This, 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 this is a failed coup, yeah. and it's a, a, a string of failed U.S. policies. 
Uh, and, you know, Obama was an excellent empire president, probably one of the best. Uh, you know, he pulled off that Ukraine coup. You know, Joe Biden's son got a job as the, on the board of the Oil. largest uh, gas, uh, private gas company. Uh, and, uh, you know, so he pulled that off. But uh, Trump, is a Trump is a very poor empire president. Yeah. I don't know if it's intentional or just his, you know, inability. Uh, but the U.S. empire is having a struggle. And there are a lot of people who follow empire as academics and not just U.S., but historically. They see the U.S. empire in decline. And they, some are predicting in 10 years it's over. So that's an amazing thing if that's true. Uh, but if it happens, as a, this, is, this Venezuela uh, mistake is going to be one of the examples of the dying U.S. empire. And this uh, experience we had at the, at, at the embassy is going to be an example of, wow, even in the United States, people stood up and went into an embassy to protect it from a coup. Uh, we were amazed. One of the best things in the embassy was the, the stuff, we, the information we got from people in Venezuela. They were making up songs about us. They were holding marches about us. They were saying, Margaret, you're a hero. David, you're a hero. They're sending us solidarity letters. It was like, oh my God. Videos was, that oh. they made saying, expressing solidarity. It was so like, that was, and, then, and, and we were told that us doing this changed the conversation in Latin America about people in the United States. That people in the United States would stand up for in solidarity. Yeah, yeah. The, the night that they were trying to break in the door and we were pretty freaked out when the State Department wouldn't guarantee our safety and, and felt like they were coming through, there were a lot of them out there and they had really been terrorizing us for days. We all kind of were like, well, let's go into a quiet room and we all went into a quiet room and we just started ex you know, talking about how, to, how do you feel about this. About 15 or 20 was at that point. And yeah, more than 20, definitely. And, and we just started saying, you know, this is what the Venezuelans are experiencing, other people are experiencing, and have been experiencing for a much longer time than we have, and it just... Think of the people in Yemen. It's so deepened our resolve uh, that it, it just, it was a very powerful experience because we felt, even in that limited time of experiencing what they experienced, that we just felt such a deep connection and resolve with the people and, and resolve to fight and continue to be in solidarity with them. So before, before we're going to take a couple of questions before we end at 9, um, I want to just make a couple of pitches. I know this is a room full of uh, fighters and activists, I can just tell. Um, I want to just, people can also pick up some of the stuff at the, uh, at the front desk. But I want to inform people about some of the solidarity activities around Cuba that are going to be taking place, and every one of these events will also have Venezuela uh, as part of the, uh, the theme of it. Um, First of all, October 18th to 20th in Washington, D.C., and I hope to see both of you there, too, will be the annual meeting of the National Network on Cuba, and that will be a very important meeting. November 1st through 3rd, uh, there's an anti-imperialist encounter for solidarity, democracy, and against neoliberalism in Havana, Cuba, which is going to gather people from all over the hemisphere, including Europe, uh, not that that's in the hemisphere, but it, plus <laughs> Europe, <laughs> that are going to uh, gather in Havana for a two-day conference and hundreds of militants, trade unionists, and others will be there. And we're organizing people that anybody wants to go here, go from here, contact John or myself and we'll tell you what the details of how you can get there legally. Um, on November 6th and 7th, um, there's going to be the annual vote at the United Nations against the U.S. blockade of Cuba. I think 27 years in a row, uh, they've been passing this with ever-increasing majorities. The vote this year will be very important because, uh, you know, we'll see if a couple of these right-wing governments in Latin America peel off and support the United States this year or whatever. So, uh, th and there'll be demonstrations in New York and a lot of cities around the United States and Canada on that date, uh, so look for that. Maybe we'll have some in Albany or people from Albany will come down to New York. and. Uh, Come all of this activity will culminate in, which is going to be public in a few days. You guys here in Albany are getting a, a, uh, a sneak preview or something. But in March, uh, probably the last weekend, we're nailing that down now, of 2020, there's going to be the second national conference for, US, for the normalization of U.S.-Cuba relations, where we're going to have a large Cuban participation in the only city in the world where we can have a in the United States where we can have 
a large Cuban participation, in, in, which is New York City, because of the United Nations. Hundreds of activists from all over the United States, Canada, will be coming into New York for this uh, two-day conference, which will be a very exciting event. So please uh, work with the Albany Cuba Committee, Venezuela Solidarity Activists, and uh, let's work together around these things. So now we're going to take a, I see this brother over here had a question. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit more about the sentiment down in Venezuela, you know, what kind of coverage was there, uh, and, you know, the rest, I guess the rest of Latin America, if you knew, if they knew more about it. Uh, I Much more widespread coverage in Latin America. It was it was big news down there, and, and we were uh, Telesur was with us, and so they were doing a lot of interviews with us. Even Univision was uh, from Mexico was calling us and doing interviews from, from the embassy. Um, yeah, There's a lot of Latin American press was out there, uh, and it was really on a daily coverage. Associated Press from Latin America, even CNN from Latin America, uh, you know, with, with coverage. But uh, U.S. there was a total. It's, it really just shows the incredible power uh, between the commercial media in the U.S. and the government. If they want to blockade something, even a story like this, which has such great video and images and conflicts and interesting stories, gets totally blocked. It was so bizarre being literally under siege by a right-wing fascist mob in the middle of Georgetown. <coughs> You know, it's like my sister flew into town with her grandkids, and she called. She's like, "I'm in D.C. You want to get together?" I'm like, "I'm in the embassy. Don't get anywhere near." <laughs> Same thing with my my son and daughter. Or wanted to come here. I get. Food. I'm gonna go. Oh, she's like, my daughter. Says, I'm gonna come there and say, "I'm your daughter. He's my father. I want you to bring him food." And it's all dope. Come and say you're my. <laughs> <laughs> Brother wanted to bring his pickup truck, and I, I'll get the food through. And I was like, no. And your son also, your My son? son? Yeah, I'm faster than that, mom. I'm like, no, really, these people will kill you. Yeah. It was very weird. It was very okay, weird. Okay, we got a few minutes left. Any other questions, statements over here? Just a question on the, the follow the money trip. Do we have any idea who was funding the people surrounding? Great him? question. Yes. Well, the fact that Vecchio was going to go in as the ambassador and that he had embezzled or is accused of embezzling $70 million uh, and is a thief from before that. Uh, we said they, and they were very well, they had tents, they had loudspeakers, Every day the, they lights, they had, the food was we, amazing. I mean, yeah. it was incredible how well, my guess is it came from Vecchio, but we don't really know. They all had matching umbrellas and ponchos and sound systems and the walkie talkies and very sophisticated, yeah. Stuff and the strobe there, lights. There was definitely a lot of money involved. Big National sound system. Endowment for democracy. National yeah. Endowment for Democracy. They, they don't usually operate in the United States, though, but it, some, I wouldn't be sure if there's some U.S. funding involved, but they had enough money from the stuff they But these were the SOS people. They were definitely affiliated with the NED. Yeah. yeah. A lot of them are rich. Anyway. NED is always, <laughs> and any, NED is always where you look. When you see something like Hong Kong or something else, we've done a lot of articles on Hong Kong, by the way. Popularresistance.org slash tag slash Hong Kong, Hong Kong dash Hong Kong. Check out Hong Kong and you want to understand what's going on there. We've done a lot of articles on that, track the money on that. Very much, you, there's a lot of reasons for people in Hong Kong to revolt. It's an uber capitalist uh, society with a, a very corporatist government, much more corporatist than us. In fact, under their basic law, which is their constitution, half their legislature has to represent industry. Oh my God. Yeah, the business literally make the laws. They get half the seats in the legislature and they're elected. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and the NEDs put millions of dollars, ever since the, the hand, 96, when the handover was Before happening, uh, which happened in 97, when the handover started happening, the U.S. has been putting money into building an anti-China. But there's lots of reasons for Hong Kongers to revolt. They are uh, living in the most expensive housing in the world. The houses are the size of prison cells, literally. The apartments, yeah. Uh, and the, uh, they, they are underpaid, overworked, no hope for the future. Uh, except for the tiny percent. It's dominated by real estate. Top 10 wealthiest in uh, Hong Kong are real estate uh, oligarchs, and then by big finance. A lot of financial system there, too. Uh, and so that's controlled by way, not by China. That's controlled by Hong Kong. Under the agreement with China, uh, China can't change that for 50 years until 2047. So all those problems are not because of China. Those are problems because of the UK colonialist agreement that Margaret Thatcher negotiated with China, that they can't touch the economy or the government for 50 years. So all this blaming China is a misdirection. 
an intentional one because of NED and because of oligarchs in uh, Hong Kong who do not want the anger of the population directed where it belongs on them. And so they misdirect it toward China. When, when was that agreement from? 1997 until 2047, 50 years. Okay. Anybody else want to say anything? Thank you, so Thank you for Thank coming. You. Thank you. Please help pick up the chairs and put them away. Thanks again to our speakers.